Congratulations, you hopefully found out something about yourself and your financial situation. And now I promise you, we're gonna get up and do the fun stuff, and that's seeing how much house you can afford in your current situation. But in order to do so, there's one last step, and I'm not really gonna guide you through it. It's pretty self-explanatory and simple. But I'm gonna ask you to go to annualcreditreport.com if you don't already have your credit score. So go to that website. It's the one that's recommended by the government, so I have full faith in it. Anyway, uh, follow the prompts. You only need one credit report, so you don't need to go through all three. Just, just the ones that will suffice for this exercise. And once you have that sweet, sweet score, we can carry on with this video. So hit the pause button, boom, and uh, come back when you're done. Now that you've found your credit score, without much further ado, we'll jump right into the Nerd Wallet Affordability Calculator. I'll link uh, the calculator down below, and if you're not going to click that link, you can just always go into your favorite search engine and type in Nerd Wallet, how much house can I afford? Once you scroll past the ads and click on this website, you'll come into a landing page like this one. Uh, it says here, where are you looking to buy? And so we'll just click next. Uh, this is your annual household income before taxes. You you found this in our DTI calculator. Well, you found your monthly. So just take your monthly and times by 12 and plug it in right here for your annual household income before taxes. How much is your down payment? Um, let's just go with what they say right now because we don't know that. We're going to explore that later. So we'll just put what they did. and. Uh, these are your monthly debt obligations. Um, so this is everything besides your rent. Um, this is your other debt. Uh, in this case, it was student loans and credit card debt, and I think that was 600 bucks. So let's just click next. And what is your credit score? Um, you can follow this if you haven't found your credit score just yet, but uh, you can click that. Or if you know it, we're gonna say good for now, and we'll see what kind of uh, impact uh, this will have on our amount of house we can afford. All right, now that you've made it past all the splash screens, let's go see what we have on our website. So the first thing we're greeted with is our budget that we have to work with. This is how much house we can currently afford. Below that, we have our monthly payment. We have a slider here that is essentially stretching our budget and our house we can afford, and our DTI. And to the right of that, we have our credit score. So let's first start with the easiest thing, and that's picking the credit score that we were uh, essentially given. If you have an average, click on average. If you have good, click good. Uh, if you have average, click good regardless and see how much more house you can afford and see how your likely interest rate will be affected. In this case, by going from average to good, we are able to afford $25,000 worth more of house. And that's because our rate went down and our payment didn't change. Essentially, we were able to allocate more money towards our principal payment, which is the payment that goes towards paying off the house, and not towards interest, which is essentially paying the lender more money because we're more risky because our credit is lower. So work on getting your credit card score up. It's one of the easiest ways to afford more house. And I just want to point out from going from good to excellent, yes, it does afford you more house and it gives you a lower interest rate, but you can see it's only $8,000. So don't let going from good to excellent stop you from buying a house. Chances are you'll be missing out on any interest rates that are, you know, still very, very low and it might, you know, tick up a couple of points and then, you know, you essentially wasted time and you're paying more money. Okay. With that said, let's go into our monthly payment. So this should be now hopefully familiar. This is our DTI at 36%. If we move it up, it goes to 43% and move it up even higher, it goes to 50%. And hopefully all these numbers sound familiar. Okay, let's slide it back down to 36%. So what is this 36%? It's essentially taking your housing of 26% and your debt 10%. The rest is your expenses and savings and your taxes. Your taxes will not change. They're calculated as a fixed percentage here in uh, Nerd Wallet, and as is your debts. Because 
a lender, when the lender sees your debts, they're not going to be wanting to pay off your debts because they can't. For them, it's a fixed number. For you, it's not. But in order to make that obvious here, if we move our budget higher, as you can see, our housing here goes higher, it's coming out of expenses and savings. It's not coming out of debt, right? So this is the only place that a lender would say, okay, well, you have to spend less money on yourself, essentially. So that's how that works. Now, of course, you can reduce your own debt and put more money towards your housing budget. Let's, let's say um, we have $200 worth of debt per month. All right, so now we went from 10% to 3% and our housing went up drastically. So we're putting less money into the pocket of other debtors and we're putting more money towards buying more house. Okay, so that's how that works. Let's go back to 600 and uh, again, you can see how quickly that gets calculated, you know, 10 plus 33 equals 43. All right, so scrolling down, um, it does break down your monthly payment into your pity payments. So yeah, your pity payments are right here, and this is your principal and interest, which equal your mortgage. And on top of that, you have property taxes, HOA fees, and homeowner's insurance. You're able to plug in your own numbers here, uh, but I don't really trust the pity payment calculator in Word Wallet. I far uh, rather defer to Zillow's pity payments. So just use this number as a whole. I wouldn't uh, rely too much on these, but we'll get into that in a second once we go into Zillow. Okay, on top of that, so our big number that we have to worry about is our monthly payment and our down payment. Once we click on this, we can see how much money we're expected to bring towards when we find a house and we wanna close on it, which is when you want to officially buy it. So when you go, and say, here, I want to buy your house. And they'll say, great, all right, come to the table with $70,000 plus an additional $8,000 to pay just for fees. So these fees do not contribute to the value of your house. They just poof, disappear into the ether. And this is the money that you're putting towards the payment of your house. Now, chances are this is gonna be a huge number. And if you don't have the 20% that NerdWallet automatically works with, you will have to adjust that in this right-hand column in Loan Details. If you're wondering what the minimum down payment is for a house in your price range, all you have to do is plug in $1 here and Nerd Wallet will automatically calculate the 3% required, in this case, which is $7,667. And we scroll down and we can see that in our down payment right here is the 766. Oh, well, we still have closing costs. So actually we need more than what we think is the minimum, right? And it is worth asking the lender to see if they can roll these closing costs into your mortgage and spread that out over 30 years. I highly recommend that. But in this case, because I am not your lender, assume that you have to you know, pay this out of pocket all up front, up once, uh, <laughs> up front, all at once. In a normal market, it is possible to ask for the seller to pay for your closing costs, but in this current market, you will have to pay this. So please look at this number uh, when it comes to how much you have to bring to the closing, uh, essentially when you uh, successfully get into contract and you purchase the house. Okay, with that said, let's go back up to the top and look at our monthly payment. Oh, that's about the same. But hey, what happened to our house? Just before we had $351,000 we could afford, and now we can only afford two hundred fifty-five. dollars What gives? Well, what gives is our down payment is below 20%. Private mortgage insurance has been added to your monthly payment. And we can see that by clicking on monthly payment and seeing a new private mortgage insurance premium has been tacked into our monthly payment. So instead of contributing this money now towards the principal of the house, it is now essentially a premium we have to pay covering the lender's cost of giving us a mortgage for putting so little money down for the house. So they're charging you this much money a month because you put less than 20% down.
This will be stuck on your mortgage payment until you hit 20% equity in a, on a conventional and it'll be there forever on an FHA loan unless you refinance. Uh, we'll get into that late in a later episode, so don't worry about that too much right now. But uh, for most people right now, that's a given. So don't worry that you have an insurance tacked onto your payment. What that will mean is you'll have to increase your DTI from 36 to 43%. All right, let's say that we're happy with this price tag here and we're comfortable paying this monthly payment because we assume that aggressive, you know, 50% is going to be too high and, you know, we like being in this, this range. Okay, so let's go to Zillow and let's see what's available for us. Okay, let's go to Seattle. Okay, it's already selected for sale. Yes, okay, price range. Let's do $100,000 minimum because we just get rid of any weird properties. And let's put our price range here, uh, baths, um, bedrooms, we don't care. All we, all we care about is that it's a house and there's no houses available. Okay, how about we only have two options to choose from. Our first option is we change this from house to condos and co-ops. And if we don't want to live in a condo or co-op you know we're itching to have our own single family house there's only one thing we can do in this case if we don't want to address our budget and that's to look into a different area in this case what we're gonna have to do is uh, oops. Uh, let's look at Kitsap oh there's a house right there fits our budget seemingly okay let's explore it a little bit Let's scroll down and we're going to get into the pity payment calculator that Zillow offers. And it's right here, monthly cost. So here's our SMA monthly cost. Okay, with principal interest, mortgage insurance, property taxes, homeowner insurance, HOA, and utilities. Okay, the first thing we look into is principal interest. It's assuming 20%. Again, we're going to be paying 3%, which is the minimum. And... Uh, our interest rate, because we are only good, well, let's, let's say we're going to be paying this much in interest at a 30 year fixed. Mortgage insurance, this is the price we have to pay for essentially borrowing money at 3% down. Uh, property taxes, that's calculated for us. Homeowner insurance, calculated for us. Okay. So this house at 300 with a 3% down will cost us $1,817 a month. All right. Well, that fits in our budget. So at that price range, let's say here, we'll have to put down 17 grand and we can afford this house. So there you go. That's how to find a home that is in your price range if you don't want to adjust anything in your budget. The only really choice you have is to change your property type or move to a different part of the state. If moving to a different part of the country or a longer commute is completely out of the picture, there's only a couple options you have left to you. The first option is increasing your down payment. So now instead of a minimum down payment, you're going to have to really work on saving enough money uh, to make this a substantial uh, contribution. So in this case, we're going to put down $30,000. What's going to happen? Now we're at 275. Okay. Well, let's put an extra 10 grand down and see what happens. Oh, I want to buy 20. Okay. So as you can see, there is, by putting down more for your down payment, you can actually afford more house. It's more than a one-to-one -one correlation there. So that's something to work towards is, is really creating a savings, a nest egg that you can use towards your down payment to afford more house if you really can't uh, pay off your debt or increase your income. And then of course you can stretch your budget and then, you know, see how much house you're left with. Now, I saved the best for last way of increasing the amount of house you can afford, and that's by reducing your monthly debt. Now, pay attention. Right now, we have a monthly payment available to us of $1,560. 
What if we dropped that to zero? What if we focused all our time and energy for the whole next year? We sold our expensive car. We don't have car payments. We focus on paying off our credit card debts. Now we have zero monthly debt. It just went up by 600 bucks. That's because monthly debt and housing payments, these two essentially are shared. So whatever goes to your debt has to come directly from your housing as well. In this case, now you can dedicate all that money towards your housing payment instead of that 600 bucks towards debt. And that's at a 36% DTI. If you were to even be more comfortable increasing your DTI and then saying you still want to pay 3% down minimum, you know, you're looking at a down payment of $25,000. You can afford a $430,000 home and your monthly payments a little over or a little under $2,600. Now, of course, you can also work on increasing your credit score. And that's going to reset this and reset this. And, uh, you know, those are all things without actually increasing your income. So, of course, you can also go to your boss and say, hey, I can pick up some slack the others are dropping, or, you know, I can uh, work on an extra project to show you how valuable I am as an employee. Uh, there you go. You know, let's say you deserve an $8,000 raise. So that's an $8,000 raise. You paid off your debt and you worked on an excellent credit score and you're still getting a minimum of 3% down and you're stretching your budget to $2,900 a month. You can now afford a $511,000 house with $30,000 down. And that's split between closing costs and down payment. Okay, now with that said, um, hopefully that was insightful. Now you know how to use this calculator and once again, you have this number, you plug it into here and uh, you know actually see how much that number would pan out in a real life scenario. Okay, uh, now for the outro, and uh, hopefully you enjoy this. Just in case you haven't been wondering, why 36%? What does that have to do with anything? Why not 35 or 40%? I mean, it's kind of an arbitrary number, 36%. Why is that the benchmark? Well, it just so happened lenders calculated that number that you can still pay their mortgage, you can still contribute to your savings, and maintain your lifestyle and disc your discretionary spending, let's call it. Meaning that you can still pay for traveling, entertainment, food, clothing, all that good stuff that keeps you at a lower middle class lifestyle for the rest of your life. If you're planning on applying for a mortgage with a higher DTI, it means you're gonna have to contribute a lot more from your gross income towards your housing expenses. That means you'll either have to dip into your savings, which you probably don't have, or two is really have to cut down your discretionary spending, meaning you have to give up all your hedonistic pleasures. That's all right, trust me. Building your net worth is far better than buying some new dumb pair of shoes every month, trust me, and paying everybody else instead of building wealth. Sorry if I crushed your dreams. It was necessary. It's really for the best. And while yes, there's a couple options that you have, that's you can lower your expectations, which means a uh, reduced amount of house you're getting or <laughs> the quality of the house you're getting. Uh, two, you can move to a different state or a different part of the state, depending on your budget. And three, you can really work on your budget. And that's what I am proposing to do. Realistically, you'll probably have to take a little bit of column A and column C is lowering your expectations plus working on your budget. And that's why the next episode is completely focused on your budget. Yeah, you probably guessed it from all the stuff I've been saying before, but this is the stuff I love because this is what will make you into a better person. We'll dive deep into really the mindset of, let's say, an investor because their mindset is completely different than your regular consumer that just goes and says, I have money, let's spend it. No, an investor says, I have money. How can I make that money into more money? That's why I call this the financial growth episode because it's only up from here on out. Yes. See you in the next episode. I want to include this little bonus video on in estimating how much house you can afford if you're just kind of poking around and wondering uh, how much is your rent worth? Like, what is it costing you uh, in a house opportunity, let's say? Well, I'm going to use my friends as an example here. I know a little bit about their uh, income and financial situation. So I'm going to use them here to demonstrate how much house they can afford instead of renting. All right, I'm going to assume that they have excellent credit. Uh, we can, 
let's do their income and debts first. Based on the positions that they hold, I think they probably make somewhere in the ballpark of $120,000 together as a married couple, and probably student loans and car payments are looking probably at $800 in debt per month combined. All right, and uh, they're currently paying $2,200, and this would give us 512 but of course this is the 20% down. They probably don't have $100,000, and um, I would venture to guess they probably have 25 uh, that they could probably save together real quick, maybe in that ballpark to put towards a down payment. All right, now let's hone this in a little bit again. So they found a rental property in Gig Harbor, and it's around $2,200. Um, and so I would say they could probably afford a $400,000 house. If this website could be more frustrating sometimes. <laughs> there we go, $400,000 house. Uh, that was That's still at a 30% DTI. And you know, if they're comfortable, I mean, th this is still well in the affordable range. If they were comfortable going to the 36%, I mean, they could afford a half a million dollar house. And if they were even going to say, okay, you know what, we can actually stretch our budget we can go up to 43%, we're comfortable with that. Then they can afford almost a $630,000 house in Gig Harbor. And of course their monthly payments are much higher, but I mean, that's also at you know 43% DTI. But if they're more comfortable at 36, they can still afford you know a, a decent house in Gig Harbor and put that money towards building equity uh, by paying off their principal rather than putting all of that money essentially down the drain and putting it towards a landlord's mortgage. Okay, well, hopefully that was insightful. That's how to quickly determine how much rent, uh, uh, how much house your rent is worth. And also, you know, if you're comfortable at this rate and you're comfortable a little bit more, uh, you know, and kind of a gut check. And then we're gonna get into the, the whole budgeting thing in the next episode. Our next episode is all about personal finance, budgeting, and mindset.